So as my wife sits down, we'll get started. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yes. Sounds okay? Yes. All righty. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Wayne Evans. I would like to welcome everyone to this very special event. And thank you for spending part of this chilly Wednesday evening with us all together tonight. You know, one time or another, we all have spent some time in a city or a town that we loved maybe on a vacation, maybe on business, maybe visiting family or friends. You parked your car, car while you were there and you never got back in it until you left. Everywhere you went, you walked. You shopped, you went to the restaurants, the parks, the public spaces. You fell in love with that city, but didn't quite know why. You were experiencing a walkable city. Each year, my wife and I take a short vacation during the wintertime. We have two criteria. Number one, it has to be warmer than here. That's a pretty low bar. But number two, the city or town has to be walkable. Over the last few years, we were lucky enough to have spent time in Savannah, Georgia, Austin, Texas, and Charleston, South Carolina. All very good cities, made great by their walkability. So before I introduce Mr. Speck, I want to talk a little bit about how we actually got here tonight. I don't see him in the room yet. Is Charlie Jefferson here yet? He's coming, he's on his way. He's having a cocktail at Terror Parade. I saw him on the way down. <laughs> but anyway, Charlie's a good friend and a local developer. He gave me a copy of the book, Walkable City, How Downtowns Are Saving America, One Step at a Time. And there is no doubt in my mind that he knew after reading Jeff's book that I would be hooked. Maybe it's because I'm a downtown resident, a former planning commission member, a current member of city council, or maybe it's just become a, a self-professed planning geek. But Charlie definitely knew that the ideas and the concepts and the clarity of Jeff's message about the importance of walkability would strike at the heart of what I believe is needed for our city. And it did. And at that point, I paid it forward. I bought another half dozen books and passed them out to individuals that I thought would get it. And then another half dozen books until we were able to build the momentum that was necessary that would bring us here tonight. And that's how positive change begins. And after tonight, we hope we will begin again with all of you. We hope to build on tonight's message and turn this into a movement to make our city more walkable and make our downtown in Scranton into the amazing place that we all know it could be. Now, one more bit of housekeeping before we get started. I would be remiss if I didn't mention all of our partners for tonight's event. All of those who stepped up and ultimately made this happen. First of all, Leslie Collins and Liz Baldy and everyone at Scranton Tomorrow. George Kelly and Lackawanna County. My friends at the Greater Scranton Board of Realtors and my friends at the Architectural Heritage Association. Charlie Jefferson and Jefferson Warner. Tim Maloney from NEPA Settlement, LLC and Maloney Law. Josh Mast and Paul Blackledge for their generosity. And finally, our host for this evening, Julie Cohen and Jessica Durkin and the staff at the University of Scranton. Thank you all. Okay, now let's talk about the gentleman that, we, that has brought us together tonight, Mr. Jeff Speck. If book sales and video views are any indication, Jeff Speck is likely the most listened to city planner in the world. Suburban Nation, which Mr. Speck co-wrote with Andres Duany and Elizabeth <coughs> Plater Zyberk, was the best-selling planning title for the past decade. The Wall Street Journal called it the Urbanist Bible. His award-winning book, Walkable City, published in 2012, has been the dominant planning title of this decade. And his TED Talks and YouTube videos have been viewed by more than three million times. Formerly Director of Design at the National Endowment for the Arts, Mr. Speck leads Speck & Associates, a boutique planning firm based in Boston. His new book, Walkable City Rules, 101 Steps to Making Better Places is available everywhere great books are sold and it is here tonight. And it's quickly becoming my new urbanist Bible. So it is my great pleasure and my honor to introduce to you all of you, Mr. Jeff Speck.
Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Great to see you all. Uh, it's my first time in Scranton. I feel like I know it because I watched that TV show. Um, I, and I think you'll see I've spent a fair, from some of the things I'm going to show you, I've spent a fair amount of time in Pennsylvania, but it's my first time here. Um, and uh, it's the kind of city you want to go to and get involved in because there's a lot of stuff happening right now that is clearly, it really feels like it's turned the corner. And it's the kind of stuff if I get involved here, I will later get credit for. So, um, so I love coming to, I love coming to places like this. Um, I got a great tour uh, from Wayne. He's an excellent tour guide because he shows you all around, but he also knows the, val he, knows, he knows the price of all the houses. <laughs> so that was especially useful. Um, and by the time we were done, we were planning my relocation. So uh, it was a great tour. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it. I, I guess I'll just do a little bit of framing saying, you know, I'm here talking about, as when the lights go down, you'll see, and I'll do it. Um, you know, I'm here talking about walkability tonight, but walkability is really just a, a framework in which to dis discuss good city planning. And we, it, my colleagues and I, it took us a while to stumble on it, and we called it by lots of different names for lots of years, uh, what we do. First it was called traditional or neo-traditional town planning, then it was called uh, the new urbanism, then it was called smart growth. Um, you know, you might just call it city planning. You know, it's kind of become city planning best practices now after so many years. It's kind of what we do, what most city planners are doing. Um, but only when it's framed, well, I've found that when you frame it in terms of walkability, first of all, it's much easier to communicate and people who aren't planners can understand it and get into it a lot more. But then surprisingly, I found that when, and, and this is kind of the structure of my talk tonight, that if you think of planning through the window of walkability, it actually allows you to, to be much more incisive and I think, I think um, um, successful in making the sort of planning decisions that will make places better. Because as, as Wayne suggested with his vacation example, I think a well-planned place is a walkable place. So uh, without further ado, I've been, taught, I've been taught how to use this screen. We're gonna go to, because I just want you to look at the slides and not at me. So we're gonna do that. Yeah, perfect. Um, and I have to stand somewhere where I can see the screen. <laughs> So I'll try standing. If it, at a certain point, if I blocked, well, you've got two screens, so that's good. So you say, if I blocked you for the whole for the whole time, just wave at me and make me move. Um, so <clears throat> I give talks on this concept of the walkable city and what makes a city walkable, and I give talks about why we need it, and I give talks about how to do it. Uh, I'm not giving you the why we need it talk tonight. I think this crowd, the fact that you're here, that you know Wayne, um, and all these things. Uh, means you probably don't need convincing uh, about that. But I should say that the discussion about why walkability is so important um, is a really important one for you to understand and for you to share with other people. So actually my book, Walkable City, which was mentioned, the first part of that book is called Why Walkability? And it's three chapters. And it's about discovering as a planner who had you know, argued for more walkable cities from the planner's Bible for so many years and getting limited attention and limited uptake, finding that there were these other folks, uh, the environmentalists, uh, the epidemiologists, the economists, who are arguing for the exact same stuff and getting much more attention and having much more success in sharing their message, because actually people care about e the economy, they care about their health, and they care about the environment more than they care about this thing called planning. Um, so it's a very important conversation to have, and uh, if you don't want to read it, you can watch this TED Talk. And I'll give you these links at the end, but um, I have a TED Talk that's called The Walkable City that uh, is just the why walkability message, which I'm not giving you tonight. Um, but we're going to talk tonight about how to do it, how to make cities more walkable, and how to make Scranton more walkable. And we begin, if you believe in walkability, you begin, let's, let's not, no, I don't like saying believe in. That's like saying I believe in climate change. I acknowledge climate change. And I acknowledge walkability. If you acknowledge the power of walkability, then um, you begin with kind of this question. Uh, if walkable places are thriving places, how do we get people to walk? That's kind of the central question of all the work that, that I do, which leads to what I call my general theory of walkability, which is a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's a theory, which is a hypothesis that's constantly being kind of modified based on experimental evidence and outcomes. And we, we're always adjusting it a little bit. Um, it's the structure of the rest of this book, Walkable City, 
Um, and it asks, well, it basically says, you know, in America, in which driving is so easy and so cheap, right, you don't pay the cost of, the full cost of driving by a long shot. Uh, you know, if you, if you have a typical, this is interesting, if you have a typical, like, large sedan, four-fifths of the cost of driving are just owning the car, and one-fifth is driving the car. So the fixed costs are very large, the variable costs are very small, every mile costs less than the mile before it. You know, if you have the car, the smart thing to do is to drive it as much as possible. And it's sitting there in the driveway between you and everything. Right? So how do you keep people from falling into their car? And the answer is that the walk has to be as good as the drive. And to do that, it needs to do four things simultaneously. It needs to be useful, it needs to be safe, it needs to be comfortable, and it needs to be interesting. And that's the structure of my book. It's the structure of, of, of my talk tonight. We're going to go through each of these one by one. And you'll see we'll be spending a lot of time on the safe walk, because that's the thing that you can generally fix pretty quickly. Um, and a certain amount of time on the others. Um, so the reason to walk, the useful walk, um, is a story I learned from my mentors, Andre Stuani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, who founded DPZ and created the New Urbanism Movement, really starting as early as the 1980s. And I always mention them because actually half the stuff I'm telling you is stuff that I learned from them, um, and half my slides I stole from them. Um, but Andres used to give this talk um, that he called the story of planning. And he talked about how back in the 19th century, people were choking right on the soot from the dark satanic mills. And the planners, who weren't yet called planners, said, hey, why don't we move the housing away from the factories? And they did that. Right? This is the Garden City movement that began in, in, in England. Um, and when the houses were moved away from the factories, of course, the lifespans increased immediately and dramatically. And the planners were hailed as heroes. And we like to say you know, the, that they've been trying to you know, experience that again ever since. So you have the onset of what's called Euclidean zoning, right? large lot, single use zoning, and the separation of the landscape into large areas of single use. And you know, this was taught in planning school for, for decades. This was the way to plan cities from the early 20th century onward where you know, retail is separate from office, is separate from medical office, and multifamily is separate from single family. And we, we now know that this is wrong, and you don't, you're not taught this. Right? Michelle, do you teach this in planning school anymore? Hopefully you're not teaching your students to do this, right? And, um, but it so happens that whenever like, my colleagues and I arrive at a place to do a plan, usually there's already a plan on the place, and the plan looks like this. So you have to undo a lot of this if you're going to do planning, which is walkable. Because of course, if each of these is a large parcel and you have to get from the shopping you know, to the house, uh, no one, and plus there's only one you know, major arterial road connecting it, no one's going to make the choice to walk. Now, I was an art history major, which they say isn't the most lucrative major. Um, but I can tell you that when it comes to planning, you don't want, whoops, you don't want a Rothko, right? You want a Syrah. Syrah was the pointillist. And the finer grain, right? The finer grain, the more confetti-like your zoning, uh, the more walkable a place will be. This is actually not a zoning map. It's just a simple land use map of what's happening in Manhattan, which technically is the most walkable place in the US. And it's even deceiving, because this red color you see here is vertically mixed use. So you just have a ton of different uses piled on top of each other. And this is why the, the trends in planning for the past 20, 30 years, really 20 years, um, has been towards zoning less by use and more by other things, like building form. Where you do form-based codes now instead of use-based codes. But the, the, the key first step then to the useful walk is to allow mixed uses in your communities. And I'm going to talk now a little bit about making new places. Almost all my talk is about existing places, but this is the part that actually we covered in the book Suburban Nation, which is about the creation of community and the building of cities. Um, and the, the fact that there's only really two tested ways to make community throughout human history. I mean, there's a million ways to make a city, but there's only two ways that we've tested by the thousands. And one is the traditional neighborhood, and the other is suburban sprawl. The traditional neighborhood, which was, was, is not an invention, suburban sprawl was an invention. The traditional neighborhood evolved naturally in response to man's needs. This is Newburyport, Massachusetts, near where I live. Um, and you see here actually several different neighborhoods of Newburyport, uh, kind of split by the main street that you see here. Um, but it's defined, the traditional neighborhood in planning terms is defined as being diverse and compact and walkable. 
The diversity is visible, you know, places to live, bigger and smaller, places to work, places to worship, places to shop, places to recreate, right? Most of your daily needs are within walking distance, as I already discussed in the earlier map of New York. Um, it's compact in the sense that actually throughout history and across cultures, most neighborhoods are about a five minute walk from edge to center. And you find this all around the world. If you think about a place we all know, or we both are likely to know, like New York City, you can think about, um, you know, the East Village and the West Village and Soho and Tribeca. And most cities, if you map them out by the known neighborhoods, they're about a half mile across, which is that quarter mile is the five minute walk from edge to center. Um, and then it's walkable because there's lots of streets. And because there's lots of streets, which we'll talk about, none of them have to be particularly large. Now, sprawl, it's clearly, clearly not compact, thus the name, sprawl. It's not diverse, entire square mile might just hold one use, as I showed you, or just one house, right, over and over again. Um, and then this is interesting, there are a lot of streets, but most of them are loops and cul-de-sacs that don't go anywhere. And that's by design, that was part of the way that we were taught to make the new city at the middle of the 20th century. And of course, when you do that, those few streets that do go somewhere have to be sized around moving all the traffic of the entire city. So you have these streets that, are, that are, are sized around moving as many cars as possible, as quickly as possible. That's their sole design criterion, right? There's no trees, there's no places to hang out, there's no bike lanes, there's no other feature of this street except moving cars. We call them traffic sewers. And like sewers, they're noxious, right? The houses turn their backs to them. In fact, what you have for the entire length of the street, there's not one address on this street. It's walls and backs of houses because it's, it's noxious. Um, and so you have the condition of the cul-de-sac, which a lot of people buying homes will tell you they favor a cul-de-sac. But you're actually, there was a new, um, what's the name of that guy? Who's the guy that ruins everything? Adam. Adam ruins everything. He did one of these on the suburbs and he, fa he, he shared the piece of data that you're 270 percent more likely to die in this kind of environment than you are in this environment <laughs> because the minute you leave the cul-de-sac you're subject to these very dangerous high-speed arterial and, co and collector roads. So not compact, not diverse clearly, and not walkable. So it's fun to break sprawl down into its constituent parts, the places where you only live, where you only work, where you only shop, um, civic institutions, you know, we know small schools are better, right? Everyone knows that. The data is very clear. Small schools are better. We're still making schools big. School size in the U.S. is growing every year, not because the student population is growing, but because of consolidation of schools. And there's a certain pride, you know, in having a big school. But, of course, the bigger the school is, the further away from you it is, right? Because it's serving a larger area. And the relationship of the size of the parking lot to the size of this school in South Florida tells you all you need to know, which of course is that no child has ever walked to the school or will. Uh, in fact, the seniors and the juniors are driving the sophomores and the freshmen with the death rates to prove it. Uh, and, then, uh, and then, you know, if you disconnect everything from everything else, which is the sprawl model, and reconnect it only with automotive or principally with automotive infrastructure, you know, this is the part that we forgot to count. Right? If you do that, then the, the, your, your federal highway system and your state roads, which were originally you know, built to handle commerce and vacation travel, they basically become commuter ways. And so many, we keep enlarging our, our highways, and yet they're never large enough because um, the, the, the limited connectivity of the sprawl model and the fact that everything's so far apart from everything else requires everyone to basically be using these highways and arterials to get where they're going. So I always tell people, you know, it's a two-part deal. This is the American dream still for some people. The way the National Association of Realtors used to do the polling, they thought that about half of America wanted this. And then they, they, they phrased the question differently and they said, do you want to live in a house that can only, where you can only walk to other houses? Or do you want to live in a house where you can walk to other stuff like shop, and wor you know, work and, and you know, entertainment. And now only 10% of Americans will tell you they want this. Of course, it's 80% of the stock. But only 10% of Americans will tell you that this is their American dream. But I always say it's a two-part dream. It comes with, it comes with the nightmare uh, attached, right? Often to absurd extremes. And the amount that we invest 
This is actually near Boston. But this happened because no one, because the mandate in all of our planning is that you can't have to, you, you, you never should be half, you never should have to sit at a signal for more than one cycle. Because in an environment that's so completely mind numbing and banal as this, if you have to sit for more than one cycle, you just want to kill yourself. And that can't, that can't be allowed to happen. So that's why, you know, we invest so much money in our horizontal infrastructure, you know, ignoring our, our schools and our civic buildings so that we can pay for this. Um, and of course, it can be, this is not Photoshop. Walter Kulash took this slide in South Florida, actually North Florida. Uh, so it's very frustrating to be a driver. It's hard on families, actually. And the statistics show you the longer your commute, the more likely you are to get divorced. Um, Robert Putnam wrote that well-known book, Bowling Alone, in which he identified the, 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 the length of your commute was the biggest predictor and how much time you were likely to spend, or actually not spend, in civic activity, in community activity. Every 10 minutes you add to your commute, you're 10% less likely to do things like, you know, run a, run a Girl Scout troop or, or run for, you know, city council. So um, that's a problem. Of course, driving can be very frustrating <laughs> and being a pedestrian can be worse. So, um, and then there's the epidemiologists. So I mentioned, I mentioned at the beginning that the doctors, the epidemiologists who were arguing for the same stuff, and it was a real eye-opener to, to uh, you know, a, a book came out in 2004 called Urban Sprawl and Public Health. And there were these doctors saying, listen up. And I got this slide from one of these doctors, Howard Frumkin. He said, the reason why we have the first generation of Americans who are expected to live shorter lives than their parents is because we've engineered out of existence the useful walk in our communities. Our diet stinks and that's a problem, but actually it's calories in and calories out. And inactivity is a bigger problem, they say. Um, so, you know, the fact that you can drive to park to take the escalator to the gym to get on the treadmill to walk is why we have such a, an unhealthy society. Um, and that's, that's important. So this, is the, so, this is where we finish talking about creating cities, but when people are proposing new developments in Scranton or wherever you may spend your time, um, these are the two images to remember. You know, the left is the sprawl and the right is the traditional neighborhood. And you just need to understand it's the same stuff, right? Just how big is it? and how far spread out is it? And then is it a network of streets where actually there's 26 ways to get from here to here? Or is it what's called the dendritic system, the branching system of sprawl in which every trip is engineered to go from the you know, local road to the collector, to the arterial, to the highway and back again. And there's usually only one good path from any location to any other location. Um, and that's the great irony of sprawl because it was designed entirely around the presumption of everyone driving, but it actually works worse, it works worse for driving. Because, you know, one engine fire on the collector road, and this is a city that's shut down for the day, right? Whereas, as I mentioned, there's 26 ways to get from here to there. So, um, uh, is it a network versus a branching system? How big are the things and how far apart are they? And that's what you need to know when you're thinking about making make in this, well, generally when you're making new places. Now in this first category, the useful walk, then we ask about existing cities. And there, as you might expect, the question to ask is, you know, in your downtown area, which uses are underrepresented? Because you want to have a good balance. You want to have a good balance of uses. Now I said something I need to qualify, which I said in your downtown area. I use the word downtown very loosely, basically to mean any place um, that's mixed use and probably has some historic like pre-war street network. Um, because it's, it's in, so it could be a main street, it could be the, the main downtown of your city, it could be some other downtowns uh, or downtowny places, right? But the, the, the main thing to understand is that since, since walkability relies on mixed use, um, you can have an area that's principally business and bring in residential um, and make it balanced. Most of your city is geographically is principally residential. Has anyone ever tried to bring a business into a residential neighborhood? Has anyone ever succeeded? At the problem is it's almost impossible, but both based both on the typical housing densities, but also on people's resistance to allow 
commercial activity in residential neighborhoods, it's pretty impossible to have a good balance of uses in a principally, or to create a good balance of uses in a principally residential neighborhood. So the place where this useful mixed use is gonna happen is in your existing downtown areas. And in most of America, in most of our downtowns, housing is dramatically underrepresented. A lot of these became central business districts that had nothing but business in them. You probably you know a lot of cities like that. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, it's interesting, you look at a place like Midtown Atlanta, it's a 10 to one ratio of jobs to housing. Uh, Boise, Idaho, 43 to 1 ratio of jobs to housing. I don't know what your ratio is here in Scranton, but I can tell you it's much more jobs and business than it is housing in the downtown core, in the area where, the, where walkability is likely to, to, to get better or able to get better. So what you find in most American cities is when you increase the amount, and you're already, you're already experiencing it, when you increase the amount of housing in your city center, everything else kicks in. And it kicks in because you start to get towards this 18-hour city. You call it a 24-hour city, but it's really more like an 18-hour city. But um, the great line about this was uh, Jane Jacobs, who wrote the best planning book ever, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, better than my books. Um, and uh, she was talking about Wall Street back in the, like, 1960. Because I think she wrote her book in 61. And she said that there were 400,000 people coming every day to work in Wall Street, but there was no great restaurant and no great gym. She said, why is there no great gym on Wall Street? Why is there no great restaurant? Because a great gym or restaurant needs a lunchtime crowd and a dinner crowd. It's what she called time spread. And that when you get that time spread, when you get midday patrons and evening patrons, all the other stuff besides the working and the housing starts to kick in and kick in really well. Eventually, even the schools get better when enough people live in a more downtown area. That's been our experience in Washington, where I lived until four years ago. I spent a decade in Washington. We saw even the neighborhood schools improving based in part on the, all the um, increased residential. So, um, <clears throat> so the lesson there, of course, is to bring more housing into your downtown. I put these slides together not knowing the data um, that I just learned from Wayne, uh, which I'll discuss in a minute, but uh, Des Moines has done a great job. The, the, the skyline in Des Moines currently is, is full of cranes. Um, and they did it because they, they made a decision as a city that they were going to invest in bringing more housing downtown. And what they did was, um, well, let's just say in 2000, they had 2,500 people living downtown. By 2020, they'll have 10,000, well, not people, but units uh, of housing downtown. And they did it with a 10-year tax abatement. So, you know, no new taxes on your property when you develop housing for 10 years. Uh, and with, with 10 more years subsequent to that of tax increment financing. So, Tremendous incentives, you know, the, the city is investing in more housing downtown because they know it's going to come back to them in the increased taxation that they'll gather from a more successful downtown. And I know that you, uh, I believe Wayne, you live here, um, but Wayne, Wayne guesses that there's about 500 new units of housing in the downtown over the past five to seven years, which is very impressive. Um, you know, most American cities are heading that way. I think you're ahead of many of them. Um, but the experience that, that you're having here, which is the experience that I'm seeing all over the country, is that you just can't build it fast enough. The stuff's being reserved and sold as soon as it's being built. The real challenge, though, is bringing it, bringing it on market affordably so that your most likely city resident, you know, downtown resident, who, I'm sorry, isn't Wayne, but is someone younger and just out of college and perhaps with less, I don't know, I don't know your situation, Wayne, but less money to spend. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> that they can find it attainable. So that's why the city needs to help so that developers can be, uh, can be providing housing at a price that your most likely market can afford, and that's how you get all the bodies in the downtown that make everything really kick in. So that's the reason to walk. We've already finished one category. Um, there are other parts of that category that include uh, transit that I'm just not going to get into because I don't have time tonight. Um, but there's other things that make walking more useful. Great parking policy, which is important to talk about. Um, better transit, which is important to talk about. But I'm going to move on to the safe walk, which has to do with being safe, but actually feeling safe, which sometimes is counterintuitive. What kind of streets make people feel like they have a fighting chance against being hit by a car? And um, I'm going to talk about 10 to 12 different things. Let's say 8 to 12. I haven't counted different things, but they all point back at this diagram, which is um, communicating that you have about a seven, 
you're, you're about seven times as likely to be killed by a car going 35 than you are by a car going 25. And that threshold of 25 to 35 is the speed at which most people are driving in our city centers. And they're setting the, drivers are setting their speeds not based on the speed limit that's posted, but on the environment and what the environment's telling them about how safe it is to drive at a certain speed. And we get this tremendous error that I think is the greatest kind of killer in the United States, um, is that still in most places, engineers are taught to design streets for speed limits five to 15 miles, sorry, for speeds, the design speed of a street needs to be five to 15 miles an hour over the speed limit that you post on the street. And don't ask me to explain why, although I probably could. But the point is that streets are intentionally being engineered for higher speeds than we want the cars to go on them because of this highway concept of forgiveness. Forgiveness somehow making streets safer, which it does if you're the driver, but not if you're a pedestrian or a cyclist or somewhere else in the, in the environment. So is the street telling you to go above 25 or below 25? Um, and not only are you more likely to be hit, um, not only are you more likely to be hurt by a fast moving car, but of course as a driver, you're much more likely to hit someone if you're going faster. Because not only do you have a shorter response time, but you're not, your cone of vision is dramatically narrowed as you're going faster and you just don't see the stuff that's alongside the road. So how do we get drivers to go slower? And I'm very careful in cities where I, I've stopped saying we have to slow the cars down. A lot of people still say that, let's slow the cars down. But people think that means that I want your commute to last longer. And the length of your commute is not a huge concern of mine, but I know it is a huge concern of yours. So I no longer say we want to slow the cars down. I want to say we want to, we want to eliminate or reduce illegal speeding. Right? That's the way we frame it. Let's reduce or eliminate illegal speeding. And the, the, there are a whole bunch of factors that add up to cars going slower. The first, which you only have so much control over, is the size of your blocks. This is Portland, Oregon, famously walkable, famously 200 foot uh, size blocks, very small blocks. This is Salt Lake City, famously not so walkable, famously 600 foot blocks. Um, this is my family or part of my family crossing the street in Salt Lake City where they actually have a bucket with these red flags you're supposed to wave so you're not plowed down uh, when you're crossing. And, and um, you know, here they are side by side. And you know, what you notice when you spend time in these places is that a 200 foot block city can basically be a two lane city. And Portland has a lot of one lane streets that are one way, one lane. Uh, it averages about two, two, two lanes per street. Salt Lake City averages about five lanes per street because there's so few streets. So each street has to be very large because the blocks are so big. Here's a study of 24 different California cities. And when the block size roughly doubles, the number of non-highway fatal crashes almost quadruples. So the bigger the blocks, the more dangerous the city. Here you are, <coughs> excuse me. This is, this is downtown Scranton and um, you have nice pretty small blocks. You also have alleys, which breaks it up a bit more, which probably adds to the safety. Um, and here you are next to Portland. And next to Portland, you don't look that good because Portland is so small and Portland is the extreme. Next to Salt Lake City, you look great. And I think here you can say with some confidence, you know, you, you, have, you have good bones, which means you might be walkable or you might not, but you have the opportunity to be walkable. You know, you, the, the, small, the smallish blocks means, certainly in, in US standards, nice small blocks, means that you have the, the, the fundamentals of being a, a walkable downtown here. Uh, and then of course there are other parts of town which aren't like that. And here, you know, it's hard to measure the block. You know, the, the blocks here almost all go off the map, right? Here's North Scranton and then here's the mall, right? Even further north where the block structure is just gone entirely. And of course you can say, okay, bad bones, but actually it's just the wrong bones, right? And that's just pointing out that it's this model and not that model. But in your downtown area, so what is this, what is this, we'll get to this in a minute, but what does this mean for you all? And basically there's not that much you can do about the block size you inherited, but there is a, there is a pressure in, in many cities to super block, to close streets, hospitals and colleges and other folks like to do that. Unless it's an isolated campus that's not part of your downtown network, we try to resist that. Because you want to keep your small block structure 
so that the cars are distributed on many small streets. Um, next is, the, as I implied, is the number of lanes. Uh, this is a conversation about traffic on streets that applies both to uh, highways uh, but also to city streets. And it's this concept of induced demand or induced traffic. Who's heard about induced traffic? Oh good, not too many of you. So <clears throat> this, is, this is something I, I include in all my talks because it's just, A, it's fascinating, and B, it's counterintuitive, and C, most people don't really know it, which is that people think this works. If you look at justifications for highway widening and for road widening and for adding new streets and new lanes, people always say we're doing it, almost always say, we're doing it to ease congestion. And ideal traffic theory tells us if this is the capacity of your street and this is the amount of trips, of course when the amount of trips exceeds the capacity you get unpleasant congestion and you widen the street to absorb that congestion and lo and behold, uh, no more traffic. But this has never ever happened because what happens instead is what's called induced traffic. People drive more when the resistance to driving is removed. And the operative, the operative phrase here is that in, and this doesn't happen if you don't have congestion, but then you wouldn't do this. In congested systems, the principal constraint to driving is congestion. So because the one thing that's keeping you from driving more or moving further away from your job, right, or, or commuting exactly on peak rush hour is the congestion, that when that congestion goes away, you make different choices. <clears throat> so in a, in a city like this, and I've worked in, um, in Bethlehem, I've worked in Lancaster, um, and those are cities where they believe they have a rush hour, but it's actually about 20 minutes. And what happens when <clears throat> there's construction and other stuff that's closing a street and the network is made less commodious, people make different decisions and they commute a little bit more off peak. And when roads are widened or highways are, are added to, new lanes are added, the rush hour shortens. And what you get by increasing capacity is basically a shorter rush hour. And what you get by reducing capacity is a slightly longer rush hour. But it's very um, <clears throat> el elastic, that's the economic, very elastic. And, and people adjust their behavior to, exa to have exactly the amount of traffic that they're, they're willing to put up with. And so the main lesson here is that you can't reduce congestion by increasing capacity and we shouldn't try. And this means, of course, adding lanes to highways, adding new highways. It also means removing parking from streets so you can have another lane in the street, right? Or just generally having wider streets. This is Newsweek magazine, hardly an esoteric publication. Today's engineers acknowledge that building new roads usually makes traffic worse. And I read this like 15 years ago and I jumped up in the air and then I landed and I said, well, who are these engineers? May I please meet some of them? Um, now, that was 15 years ago. And I should say the engineering, first of all, everything I'm telling you about this, I learned from engineers. So there are engineers who are at the cutting edge of this. Secondly, more and more engineers will now acknowledge induced demand. But I still have yet to see a traffic study telling you you need some new highway that acknowledges induced demand, except in California, where you have to by law. But you know, the traffic engineers, I've had three different projects in three different states where the county traffic engineer turned our central street from a two lane to a four lane, reaching up to farmland, because they said, oh, the traffic is going to come. And of course, then the traffic does come, because you've provided the means for a lot of cars. <clears throat> Here's the study presented at the Paris School of Economics, the fundamental law of highway congestion, very straightforward. Actually, I have no idea what this means. Uh, but I do know what the outcomes are, which is that within, well, immediately 40% of the new capacity is met by new driving trips, and within four years, it's all absorbed in new trips. So you might get three years of, or four years of less traffic, but it won't last. And sometimes immediately, like the four, was the 401, 405 in LA, when they, they had to, you know, spent a billion dollars, it took a year, they closed it down, they had two Carmageddons closing it down, uh, they reopened it, and it reopened with more congestion than before. And we've had that experience now in a lot of places. So I always tell this story wherever I go, and like, well, isn't that interesting, fascinating, and then I just give up on it. Because you guys might understand it, but there are a lot of people who aren't in the room, and still, 
there's just too much money to be made widening streets and building highways, and it's just, it's just a hard argument to win. And so I say, let's not focus on that. You know, let's, let's not try to base our policy on this condition of induced demand. Let's instead look for some streets <coughs> that might have too many lanes that aren't congested. Because what I find in most cities where I work, less so in the Northeast, maybe less so here, but most cities where I work, there are actually streets that aren't congested that are still too wide. And we have to look for those. So this is Oklahoma City. And Oklahoma City was named in Prevention Magazine about 12 years ago, Prevention Magazine in its best cities for walking issue called it the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country, which kind of, it's a nasty thing to be called. Um, and the mayor came running to me and said, what do we do about this? And I said, let's do, a wa let's do a walkability study. And he said, what's that? And I said, I don't know, but let's do one. <laughs> um, and I've since done 14 of them, including in Bethlehem and Lancaster. And um, we looked at the car counts in the downtown streets, 4,000, 5,000, 9,000. Now, any engineer, good or bad, will tell you that a two-lane street can handle 10,000 cars per day or about 1,000 cars at peak hour. That's two lanes, no turn lanes, just lane going one way, a lane going the other way, 10,000 cars per day. And these streets, as I mentioned, look at the numbers. It turns out that these were streets that in the brand new downtown master plan were going to be built and rebuilt as, as four to six lanes. 10,000 cars a day, 8,000, 5,000, 5,000, 4,000. Streets like this that could by all rights be a two lane street and not be congested were five lane, six lane streets and gonna stay that way. And I said, look, you have this tremendous mismatch between supply of lanes and demand for lanes and that's money in the bank. This asphalt is stuff we can use for other things like additional parking, which of course the merchants really need and love or bike facilities, which they didn't have any of. So um, happily, the, like the day after I completed that study, Devon Energy announced that they were gonna be building this like 50 story tower in the downtown core that was gonna generate $200 uh, million in tax increment. And they were asking the question, what should we spend that money on? And we said, let's, they said, let's rebuild every street from building face to building face in our downtown core. Save the trees that are there, but let's rebuild all the streets. And it was my job actually to redesign essentially the curb to curb of these streets. And given this reality of traffic counts versus lanes, we were able to double the amount of on-street parking, just double it, and add a bike network where there was no bike network. So a street like this, you know, four lanes to, uh, to, a, to a dead end, um, becomes two lanes. Here it is under construction. Uh, and then this street, which is the biggest arterial through the downtown, Sheridan, needed to keep its left turn lanes, um, but we we were able to put in the median, shorten the left-hand turn lane to right at the corner. Uh, you see the bike lanes uh, that were put in. Um, this is what you do if you have money. And, and, and I say that, and I always remember to follow this with this image, which is, in most cases, you shouldn't rebuild, you should restripe. Because for the price of rebuilding one street, you can often restripe you know, a whole neighborhood. Um, so don't think that you're Oklahoma City, but just bear in mind, I'm gonna give you a counter example at the end, but just bear in mind that there are ways to accomplish this without, without a ton of money. Um, now, in terms of number of lanes, you know, I don't have your car counts. I don't know what the opportunities are. I don't know where the congestion is and where it isn't. I know that you have a state highway running through your downtown on uh, Mulberry and then Jefferson and then Pittston um, that is, is designed as state highways are uh, to, move, uh, to move a lot of traffic and um, it certainly comes in as a highway. And I guess, you know, this is the first street, it's not the only street, it's the first street to look at because of the number of lanes it has. You know, it lands with five lanes, here we are coming in off the bridge, uh, and then it's four lanes, I'm gonna talk about the four lane section in a minute with a different idea, um, but it's four lanes through the heart of downtown, maybe it doesn't need to be. Um, and, you know, Mike is here from the DOT, where'd Mike go? And I'm really glad the DOT is here, but I have to be careful what I say, because the DOT is here. Um, <laughs> but in most communities, it is a struggle with the DOT 
that it's their mandate to move as many cars as they can, as quickly as they can, that's their job, right? It's a struggle with them to satisfy both the needs of commuters who want to get through the town at a reasonable pace um, and um, the people who want to have a place that's as nice to arrive at as it is to drive through, right? So that's a constant tension. But it's not just DOT streets, and I should say the DOT streets no offense to the DOT, are the hardest ones to change because you have to go through the DOT to change them, they're not yours. But you own a lot of your streets, I believe you own, I believe the city owns Spruce Street, you own most of your streets, and so you have to ask yourself, does Spruce need to be three lanes? It's a very simple arithmetic, right, to look at the car counts, look at the number of lanes, and see where there might be some extra give there. Now. Here's a whole separate issue, which is the idea of the four-lane street. And this is something that's been done successfully in Pennsylvania a number of times, and it's called the great, the classic American road diet. And the classic American road diet takes a four-lane street and turns it into a three-lane street. And it's, uh, the, the first thing to know is that, is that four-lane streets are, are very dangerous, right? There's a lot of rear-ending that happens because of people stopping to turn. There's a lot of T-boning that happens because of people turning. These guys stop and these guys don't. Um, they're very dangerous. But they're also very inefficient because, you know, the fast lane is also the turning lane, which creates a lot of jockeying, which creates that kind of wave pulse congestion and, and slows the streets down. So when you do this, you make it more efficient, as I'll describe. You certainly make it safer, um, but you also gain 10 feet or 11 feet to use for something else, to use for bike lanes, to use for parking, right? You're getting 10 feet or more out of the street. So here's some data. Uh, they're not always this successful, but it's always safer when you go from four lanes to three. Um, but this is the data that surprised everyone. These are 23 different uh, road diets. Uh, all but one are the four to three classic American road diet. And the car counts before and the car counts after are pretty much identical. If you add up the two columns, there's actually more after. So these cars are, these streets are handling just as much traffic as they did before with three lanes instead of four. So whenever you see a four lane street, it's very possible, in fact likely, a four lane street, it's very possible it could be made a three laner without impeding its throughput of vehicles based on this data. Um, so you have Mulberry, as I mentioned, which has a pretty significant four-lane section through the downtown. Um, and then you also have Wyoming, which isn't a state road, if I'm correct. Um, so any of these four-laners lane, four uh, could become three-laners, and then all of a sudden you have room for bike lanes or more parking or something else. Be particularly useful on Mulberry because Mulberry, as you know, has no parking along it which many state, many Penn, many Penn, dot states, uh, Penn dot streets do have parking on them. So that's not against the rules. Okay. So now that I've come out in favor of turn lanes, I have to say, watch out for turn lanes. Because some streets don't need them. And when you have a turn lane you don't need, it actually is extra asphalt you shouldn't have. This is Bethlehem, where these used to be successful stores until PennDOT, before Mike's time, I'm sure, PennDOT came in <laughs> and put in this left-hand turn lane, which is the length of a football field, and serves a house, a street down here with seven houses on it. But somehow we needed a left-hand turn lane to go down that street. And of course, all these shops are dead. Because you can't, a typical shop in America needs the parking in front uh, to, to succeed. So excessive turn lanes are also a problem. Now, left turn lanes at least serve a purpose, which is, of course, to to smooth traffic when you have cars waiting to turn left. Right turn lanes, which you don't see so much anymore, um, they, they speed traffic a little bit, but they, they add a lot more danger than the amount of traffic that they, that they smooth. Um, and you have a lot of right turn lanes here, more than most cities I've seen. So that's something to pay attention to. When I was in Lancaster, the principal contribution I made, and this has been, part, this has been partly accomplished with PennDOT, um, was identifying all of these turn lanes that could be dr dramatically shortened or eliminated. And the basic strategy I, for the, I had for their downtown was just to shorten and eliminate turn lanes um, because we weren't going to have much luck doing things that were more dramatic. So that's why I call this the strategy. The strategy for Lancaster was to shorten and eliminate these. 
Now, one-way streets, you have four or five of them or six of them in your downtown. Um, some cities have entirely one-way streets in their downtown. Most cities, almost all cities, didn't used to have any one-ways in their downtown. It's important to understand that one-ways, that multi, sorry, multi-lane one-way streets were, were um, inflicted upon our cities all around the U.S. all at once from around 1955 to 1980. And the typical American city got a pair or dozens or somewhere in between of two-way streets that were reverted to one-way. Also with the idea of speeding traffic. And of course you can understand why because there's no impeded left turn lanes on a one-way street, right? So these one-way pairs make traffic uh, move more slowly, uh, sorry, more, more speedily. Um, but one-way streets, and, and this, was, this was at first disputed, um, and there are still people who will disagree with this, but most engineers who are up to date will now tell you with, very, with a great amount of confidence that one-way streets are more dangerous uh, than two-way streets. Why are they more dangerous? Well, there's all this you know, momentum of all these vehicles going the same way at the same time. Um, there's um, the, the um, fact that it looks and feels like a highway, right? All these cars going the same way. It, this is in Davenport, Iowa, where my, where my wife is from. All these cars going the same way, it feels like a highway. But I'm pretty convinced, and I can't prove this, but I'm pretty convinced that the, 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 the key factor is the opportunity to jockey, right? When you're a driver and there's more than one lane to be in, that changes your mindset as a driver because you could be going faster than you're currently going. And you know whatever lane you're in, the other lane is going faster, right? And, <laughs> I mean, it's my habit. I used to have a street like this driving home from work in Miami every day for a decade. And I, wasn't, I didn't even have to be in a hurry, right? The game was, how can I get to the highway as fast as possible? And I would play that jockeying game. It turned out to be the right lane was the best lane in Miami. So, um, you know, they're just not, uh, they're, they're, they're not as safe. And uh, a recent study that bore that out was in Louisville, Kentucky, where Brooke, first, second, and third streets were all, uh, you know, of course they were all originally two-way streets, but they were one-way streets now, and they made a decision to revert Brook and first back to two-way travel and keep second and third as one way. So when they did that, second, um, when they did that, on the two-way streets, car crashes dropped by almost half, and crime even went down by almost a quarter. This is interesting. I'll talk a bit about business vitality, but one-way streets are also bad for business for a number of reasons. But when you go through a cross street on a one-way street, the stores there never get seen. See what I'm saying? The stores in the cross street facing this way never get seen by any drivers. The same thing is true of crime. If you have houses or buildings with gaps between them, there are shadow zones which are, make you invisible to traffic. Whereas two-way street, it lights up the whole street. So that's, that's what happened when crime went up because there were more places to hide and do drug deals and other stuff on the one-way street. The one-way streets, car crashes actually went up and crime went up, probably displaced from the, <laughs> from the two-way streets. Um, citizens understand this when, properly, when it's properly explained to them. This is New Albany, Indiana, uh, where I did a study and it was an entirely, I say was, it was an entirely one-way grid in the downtown and uh, about Four years ago, my colleagues and I did a study and we recommended reverting the entire grid back to one-way traffic and they did nothing for three years uh, and then last summer they did it all in one month and the entire thing is two-way now. Cars are going much more smoothly and, and um, safely. Um, the great business story that we heard about years ago is from Vancouver, Washington, uh, which was publicized in this article in Governing Magazine by the well-known writer uh, Alan Ehrenholt. And, um, Vancouver tried all the, what I call the quick, the quick fixes of the 80s. You know, they had a downtown, it wasn't doing well. They tried the six Bs, the, the berms, the banners, the bollards, the bandstands, the balloons, and I forget the sixth one. But nothing helped until they finally convinced the DOT to make it a two-way street. And when they made it a two-way street, according to this article, the revenues to the businesses simply doubled. It wasn't getting any more traffic, just people were more likely to stop, more likely to shop because they were going both ways on the street. So, um, and I know you have one-way streets because I saw it on the office. <laughs> and you have 
Linden and Spruce and Penn and Washington and Adams in the downtown core. Now, I want to make a point about Penn. Penn is not a problem because it's one lane. Now, would Penn be more vital as a business street with two-way traffic? Maybe, but then you'd lose your angle parking. So probably we don't want to change Penn. But the other four are Washington, multi-lane one way, Adams, multi-lane one way, Linden, and Spruce. And they could all be reverted to two-way travel. So it's, it adds up to SLAW, S-L-A-W. Spruce, Linden, Adams, and Washington. That's how I remember it. <laughs> but my, my, you know, I would think that upon, I, I know that certain people, including Wayne, have been advocating for investigating those reversions, um, and it's really worth uh, looking into that because the data suggests that it will be safer, but also that your businesses will do better. So that's the one way. And then you have this really weird condition where you want to drive around the square and you can't. <laughs> that works, but these two are going the wrong way. So um, and that's a problem. That, that is a problem. So um, next. Next is the width of the streets or the width of the lanes. Andre Stuani used to show this slide and he'd say, the, the streets have gotten so wide that the typical road to the typical subdivision in America is now wide enough to allow you to experience the curvature of the earth. And it's true. <laughs> because the standards have changed. So here's a neighborhood from the, um, from the 60s. Look at the width of the streets. And here's a neighborhood from the 80s. Same height of airplane, same size of house. Look what happens between the 60s and the 80s because the standards have changed such that my old neighborhood in South Beach in Miami where I lived for a decade, uh, this street wasn't draining properly so they had to rebuild it. And when they rebuilt it, the new standard kicked in and we lost half our sidewalk and our street trees when it was perfectly good before. But the, these new standards require wider streets. They're often fire department standards for certain clear zones, which we could get into why that they're, they're uh, often expected. But the fact is that faster street, wider street is a faster street. People know intuitively that a 12 foot lane is a highway lane. It's a 70 mile an hour lane. And a 10 foot lane is an urban lane. It's a 40 mile an hour or less lane. So when you build lanes, wider than 10 feet, people drive faster on them, as this study shows. Um, and there's a number of studies that make it very, I mean, there, there's now no longer dis disputing that people drive faster on wider streets. Um, citizens often demand narrower streets when they sense a problem in safety. And then some cities like Portland, Oregon, you know, famously well-planned Portland, Oregon, even had a skinny streets program. Now, here we're talking about a different kind of street and it's relevant to you uh, for reasons I'll explain. But this is a local neighborhood, these are local neighborhood streets that are not carrying significant through traffic. And they're what you call a yield street or a queuing street, where you have a single roughly 12 foot lane that handles traffic in two directions. Many of us grew up on streets like this, I did, where you, know, you, could, play, you could play street hockey and touch football in the street because it was so slow. And and these are the best, the best streets in the best neighborhoods in America have, are, are this narrow because they're handling very few cars. It's even in the Ashto, it's even in the Engineer's Green Book, this thing called the Yield Street or the Queuing Street. It's illegal most of the places where I work, but certain four, but we, we get them, we get them made legal in residential neighborhoods and we build them like this neighborhood outside of um, Charleston that's called Ion. Um, this is a two-way street. It's about 20 feet wide. Notice 20 feet, you park one side, 26 feet, you park both sides. Um, and the developer who developed this, his name is Vince Graham, and he's a very good speaker. He goes to conferences and he, he shows off his, his narrow streets and he quotes this famous philosopher who said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to life. <laughs> and it's true. This plays very well in the South, as you might imagine. So. Uh, but when it comes to downtown streets and through streets, thank goodness, because the argument, it used to be 10 feet, and then it became 11 feet, and then it became 12 feet. In Omaha, Nebraska, it's still 12 feet, which is why I've boycotted Omaha. But uh, thank goodness now, finally, NACTO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, has officially endorsed 10 feet. 
And they say wider than that might make sense in a special bus facility, but it generally is not uh, appropriate for cars driving because wider is faster. And so you have an interesting condition here, which is the same condition I found in Bethlehem, which is a lot of your streets have an extra five feet. So here's Linden, which you'd think it would be, you know, parking spaces used to be seven feet, now they're eight feet, seven and a half is fine. Um, so let's say seven and a half, seven and a half, ten and ten, be about 35 feet. Well, it's 40 feet, so you've got an extra five feet. Mulberry Street here, two lanes of driving, one of parking, so it should be about 27 or 28. Well, it's 33, so extra five feet. Vine Street, this should be 35 or so, it's 40. Uh, by, uh, what's his name? Coopers. Coopers and famous fish restaurant. Wa uh, it's Washington? Yeah, Washington. Should be 35, it's 40. We found this in, in Bethlehem also. So what do you, sorry, in, in Lancaster. So what do you do? You do this. Just one bike lane, put the pair somewhere else. You've got a lot of other places to put it. But one bike lane, even if no one bikes, which will change once you have enough bike lanes, but even if no one bikes, what it does is it visually narrows the space of the street in a way that causes cars to go more, uh, to go more slowly. Um, that's uh, an opportunity you have in a street like Clay, which is one way, we'll talk about that, um, and should be about 25 feet or so, but it's about 30 feet. So you can do what they do in Washington, D.C., which is to in, just take a street, this is what happened in D.C., had an extra five feet, so we stick the bike lane in there. Why not, right? It'll slow, it'll slow everyone down a bit. Or, remember I mentioned these, what I'm wondering about Clay Street and about Monroe and many others is why not um, make them two-way if they're not handling a lot of traffic, which they don't seem to be. And then you'd have these great little residential streets that are actually slowing cars down as they go through, sorry, limiting speeding mm -hmm. as cars go through them. So Monroe is actually 34 feet. Now in Portland, this is, in Portland, this is 26 feet. So it's even wider. In fact, it's not what you would call a yield street, it's what you would call a slow flow street, which the lanes are more like eight feet wide. Uh, this is an example in a new development of a slow flow street where you have about eight feet from uh, 16 feet from park car to park car. So just an idea. I don't know what the right solution is, but you can be adding bike lanes or reverting two-way traffic to these over-wide one-way streets. Okay. Cycling is the, you know, if you're in planning, cycling is the biggest revolution currently underway in only some American cities. This is Portland, Oregon, you know, which invested in cycling. What you find in city after city is cycling investment leads to cycling population. Climate matters a little, topography matters a little, culture matters a little, but it's the, it's the investment that leads to the cycling population changing. In Portland, they invested $60 million, but they did, they did it over 30 years, so only a couple million dollars a year. They went from biking about the same as the rest of the country to biking 15 times as much as the rest of the country. And my friend Tom Brennan sent me these slides. I said, send me some slides of the bike commute in Portland. And he sent me these slides. I said, is this bike to work day? He says, no, this is Tuesday in Portland. <laughs> because they made that investment. Um, this is uh, Pittsburgh, not too far from here, exhibiting what we call the gold standard of the protected bike lane. This is a two-way lane. Not sure why this guy is here. Two-way lane, door buffer, parallel parking that's been pulled off the curb and placed in the street as a buffer between the moving vehicles and the, and the bike lane. Here's one in Chicago, also going the wrong way. <laughs> but you see how this works. And this is the gold standard because um, you know, it really makes the bike, bicyclists safe. Here's one in New York City in Prospect Park West. They went from a three-laner one way to a two-laner, pulled the cars off the curb, and um, of course, you know, the number of cyclists went up, speeding dropped precipitously, injury crashes dropped precipitously, um, but remarkably, with the reduction of car capacity, they did not lose the throughput of vehicles. The throughput did not drop, because basically people were speeding from red light to red light on the street, and now the traffic is flowing more smoothly. Now, this being New York, of course, there was a, 
a, a five-year drawn-out lawsuit, uh, but eventually the bike-hating NIMBY trolls grudgingly surrendered to reality. Um, and I like to contrast this picture with this one I showed you before, because let's face it, no one really wants their daughter in the door zone, right? And plus, you know, with deliveries and Amazon and everything else, there's always some, someone in that. If you don't protect the lane, someone's parking in it, right? There's always something in the lane, sometimes something stupid in the lane. But, um, you know, if the lane is adjacent to the street, people put stuff in it. So, um, urban cycling, it's not a cult, right? <coughs> Business leaders will tell you, particularly tech companies and companies that want to attract young talent will tell you that bike lanes are very important to them. I haven't seen many here. Um, people's impression of cyclists for many years has been this, you know, the mammal, the middle-aged male in Lycra. But that is not, that, this is your target audience. It's not him, it's her. Or to be more accurate, it's also him. And people think that bicycling is elitist. And I heard this in, Lang in Langstrip. I said, oh, but bicycling is for elites. Um, but in fact, if you look at the data, the poorest 39% of us are doing, um, are doing, sorry, the poorest 25% of us are doing 39% of the bicycle commuting. So if you're interested in equity and making investments that can, that's going to help not the elite, but actually more people who need the help, then cycling infrastructure is certainly appropriate uh, for that. <clears throat> I'm working my way towards the end of this very long category. Just so you know, the last two categories are very short because I don't want to take too much of your time. But uh, this is the big kahuna, the safety category, for a number of reasons. The biggest reason why I spend so much time on safety is that I don't like to see people get hurt or killed. But the, the other reason is that it's the thing that cities can change very quickly. The other three categories, the useful walk, the comfortable walk, and the interesting walk, are pretty much a function of what's next to the street and what's embracing the street. And that takes many years and takes a lot of, of players, private sector and others, to make that work. But the streets are something that a city can fix very quickly. And that's why I focus so much on the streets. So next up is parallel parking, an essential barrier of steel that protects the sidewalk from moving vehicles. You are not comfortable on a sidewalk if there's not something between you and the moving traffic, as I experienced tonight walking here on this street with cars blowing past me three feet away, right? Lanes right next to an unprotected sidewalk. This is Fort Lauderdale in Florida, famous for its happy hour. This is Himmershe Boulevard. You're allowed to park, you were allowed to park only, before my walkability study, you were allowed to park on only this side of the street and you weren't allowed to park on that side of the street. So here's happy hour on the park side of the street, and here's happy hour on the unpark side of the street. Thanks, thankfully, they've, thanks to my study, they've put this parking back, and this restaurant that went out of business has been replaced by one that is now in business. But the parking is necessary to make the curb feel safe. What we did in Lancaster was actually an inventory of places where there was room for parking, but just for some bizarre reason, the parking wasn't there. Uh, and that came out to be this. About half these spaces, I believe, have been reintroduced since my study there. But we found like 100 or so spaces, more than that, um, that were just kind of inexplicably not available for parking. And of course, it's good for the merchants to have more parking in your downtown. And then the other part of this picture is the street trees. Right? And street trees do so much. I dedicated a whole chapter of Walkable City to street trees because of all the amazing things that they do, which include you know, reducing um, urban heat islands, um, absorbing CO2, absorbing ozone, absorbing stormwater. Most cities have stormwater issues. The best way to solve your stormwater problems is to plant a ton of trees 20 years ago. But if you didn't, you can future-proof yourself by planting a lot more trees now. But um, you know, the other thing that street trees do is they slow cars down. <laughs> and yes, in this case it was abruptly, but there was a study in Orlando, but for, you know, for years, for years engineers were told not to put trees along streets because they were FHOs, fixed and hazardous objects. But the st a study in Orlando compared one boulevard in the part with the trees and the part where there were not trees, and of course the part with trees had fewer accidents because people were driving more slowly when the trees were around. So and they all, you know, this is what a sidewalk feels like when you don't have the parked cars next to it or the street trees next to it. Um, you, your university 
where we are, this is a brand new sidewalk. Not only is it lovely and beautifully made, but the university, I was told, has a standard where when they build a sidewalk, they're going to put regular nice street trees in it every 25, 30 feet or so. I don't believe your city has this standard, but your city should have this standard. You can't build a sidewalk without street trees if you want to invest in the value of your city, in the downtown at least. Signals. <laughs> this is artwork. This is not a roundabout with a signal. <laughs> um, we generally are over-signalized in the US. And you know, there's plenty of intersections you have. There's plenty of intersections you have that need to have signals. But I'm, best, I'm guessing you have some that don't. And um, if you can get rid of the signals, you will probably make the intersection safer. The experience was in Philadelphia, uh, where <clears throat> in 1997, they actually removed 472 signals and replaced them with all-way, you know, four-way or all-way stop signs. And uh, they tested 199 of them. Crashes dropped by a quarter. Severe injury crashes dropped by 63%. And severe pedestrian injury crashes dropped by more than two-thirds. Um, and this is funny. The traffic engineers in Philadelphia believe that the safety benefit stems from elimination of the local habit of speeding up to beat the red, because that only happens in Philadelphia. <laughs> but um, uh, a four-way stop is actually, uh, oh, and, and then here's, here's a little study, one intersection that was done in, if you're on Twitter, follow Dong Ho Chang, Dong Ho underscore Chang. He's the public works director in Seattle, and he's a real walkability and bikeability friend. Um, and here's some data from Seattle. Um, this one's in, in Eugene, uh, Oregon. Um, but this is, you know, this is a dream intersection because, of course, it has the beautiful paving and the bollards and everything else. But I, I like to say that the four-way stop is the, is the new roundabout. And I'm not a huge fan of roundabouts. Roundabouts are super safe and they're, they're fantastic in suburban environments. They just don't feel very urban. So I generally don't put roundabouts in main, main you know, urban or shopping oriented intersections, they are very safe, but they still feel very automotive. And a four-way stop, you know, everyone who isn't breaking the law is going through it very slowly. Most people stop, a lot of eye contact, pedestrians are almost always waved through, and of course the cyclists just blow through, that's what we do. Um, but point is, it's, you know, I mean, look at this image, it's, it's accommodating to everybody, um, <coughs> and that's why I like them. And then push buttons. I'd used a couple out here. Most of them don't do anything, and I'm not speaking like rhetorically. Most of them don't do anything. 80% of them actually don't do anything. I don't know about your city, that's more of like a national standard. Um, at best, what they do is, is nothing. <laughs> at worst, what they do is bring you a walk signal when you wouldn't get one unless you asked for it. Which, of course, is horrible, because you're new to an intersection. You show up, you wait, you wait, you wait. Eventually, you figure out you have to push the button. It's a tremendous insult. But pedestrians should never have to ask to get the light, right? So most walkable cities, Boston, where I live, is a very sad exception. But most walkable cities actually don't have them. Chicago doesn't have them. DC doesn't have them. New York doesn't have them, except on certain key state routes and other places where there's a ton of traffic and you need them. But, but uh, the, the walkable, safe intersection uh, if it has a signal, has what's called a concurrent signalization. You get the green, you get the walk when the cars get the green. Or in fact, better yet, you have what's called the LPI, the lead pedestrian interval, where you get the walk a little bit before, three seconds before, a ton of these in New York City, three seconds and also DC. You get the walk a little bit before the cars get the green so you can claim the crosswalk before the cars try to turn into you. But this idea of a different cycle for every turning motion and waiting and pushing it's not what you find in walkable cities. In walkable cities, the cars learn to let you cross before they try to turn. And that's what you should do here also. And then, of course, there's lots of fun things happening with crosswalks. And here we might talk again to the state, because different states, not just the DOTs, but like state enabling legislation, can limit what you do with your crosswalks. But I think that you know, the main goal is to get the driver's attention. And if it looks like it's floating in front of you, I think that's a good way to do it, right? But this is probably illegal in many American cities because it doesn't meet a certain standard, which, which I think requires some experimentation. And things like slip lanes that are really made to speed traffic. So when I work in places like Lancaster, we make proposals. And the, the basic rule for crosswalks is put one on every desire line. Eliminate slip lanes because those are 
encourage. Those are highway, they look and feel like highway devices and put them everywhere. And then here's one that was completed. Um, this is in Chicago, but you can see how they're necking down the intersection and just really making it feel like a place for pedestrians. So there's a lot of really interesting um, uh, innovation happening in the crosswalk space right now. Um, if I was a venture capitalist, I'd be investing in disruptive crosswalk designs. Um, but that's something to pay attention to also. Okay, we're almost done. So that was, that was did anyone count? Was that like 12 things or eight things? Or that, those were a bunch of them and not all the things that add up to walking being safer. Now the comfortable walk, it's a little bit, it's a little bit counterintuitive because we all like, um, we all like broad, we all like broad views. You know, we're Americans, we like climbing mountains and getting broad views. Uh, but we also like to feel constrained. And here, here and, you know, the reason we go to Europe, you can get both, right? The broad view and the constraint. But a, a, a lesson you learn from looking at the places that you love to inhabit in urbanism is that we like to feel enclosed. And if you're an urban designer, you try to make what we call outdoor living rooms. Because a plaza is only as good as its edges. You know, a street is only as good as its walls. And it's this sense of spatial definition that we really crave. The evolutionary biologists tell us that all animals our humans included, are simultaneously seeking prospect and refuge. So you want to be able to see your prey, sorry, you want to be able to see your predators before they get you, and you want to be able to feel that your flanks are covered from attack. And that's in your bones from thousands and thousands of years of evolution. You can't help having that feeling. So you know, we like prospect. This is from season seven, episode 15, The Search, which happens He's wandering around downtown Scranton and he goes up to the top of the building because he wants the prospect and we all know what happened next. But prospect, but also refuge. <laughs> the, walls are very, the walls are very important. Uh, and we've been talking about this, we, you know, we new urbanists have been talking about this for many years. You know, three to one, great. One to one is the Renaissance ideal. Uh, beyond six to one, unless you have trees or something necking the space down, Beyond about six to one, you don't feel that space anymore. So how tall are the buildings? How close are they to the street? Or are there buildings next to the street? Because typically if there's a surface parking lot or something else that's wrecking your sense of spatial definition. So, you know, one to six, Salzburg, further north than Montreal, you know, pretty ideal. Uh, and of course the opposite of Salzburg is Houston, but, um, this is an old image of Houston. Houston is doing a lot better now than in this image, but I show this image because it reminds us that the surface parking lot is the principal villain in this desire to achieve spatial definition of our streets. And the best spaces, the best streets in Scranton are the ones that have these nice tall buildings and pretty close to a one-to-one -one ratio of height to width. And of course, um, you have the wonderful, and, and I should say, this sets you apart from many of the places where I work, that you had this incredibly robust edge, and you didn't tear down very many or any of these buildings. Maybe there's one. <laughs> Maybe there was a fire, right? But you have this great edge around your square, which is what makes it a great square. And without it, it wouldn't be. And then you have, of course, the, the sprawl example, the areas where no one's walking, no one's expected to walk, allows the parking lot to go in front, something you never want to be doing in your downtown. Um, but then you have this one, you have a few places that are problems, but uh, the one main one that needs your attention is Linden and Wyoming, where you have this kind of yawning area that, that cr creates a discontinuity in, in comfort between one and another, two, two rather walkable streets. There's this discontinuity that happens here that is causing some people to turn around. I would argue from my experience. Um, and I'm just showing you here a little page back when my graphics were much simpler uh, in the Bethlehem uh, walkability study uh, where you, know, you identify the missing teeth and you make proposals like these are the places to build first so that those missing teeth are filled in so that you have spatial definition of the primary walking axes. And then finally, the interesting walk we humans were among the social primates. Nothing interests us more than other humans. And if there aren't other humans around or signs that other humans might be around, then we just get bored and we're much less likely to walk. So, you know, I talked about one-to-one -one being the Renaissance ideal. 
This is one to one. Uh, this is in Grand Rapids, very walkable downtown. Uh, but no one wants to walk on this street, which connects the two main hotels, because you know when one side of the street is a exposed parking deck, and the other side is a conference facility that was apparently designed in admiration for that car parking deck. <laughs> you know, it's just boring. It's just super boring. No one wants to walk. So we, here we go. Blame the architects. Okay, I did that. Um, no one wants to walk past that. We learned from Mayor, Mayor uh, Joe Riley, mayor of Char a great urban urbanist, mayor of Charleston, South Carolina, for 40 years. Uh, he taught us a long time ago that it only takes 20 feet of, of building to hide 200 feet of parking. And this thin edge is super important. It's all you need. You know, here's another version. Um, this one's in South Beach. I call it the Chia Pet Garage. <laughs> but they managed to preserve the, the Art Deco storefronts below the new parking lot. Um, and then, like most cities, like most cities, you have the parking decks that broke the rule. And then you have some parking decks that didn't break the rule. And this, it's, it's not the best showing. It works much better at the corner. But if you're going to do this, the, the height needs to be significant, you know, so the stores can really work. Um, and you want to, you know, you want to make sure it's in an area where retail is likely to succeed. But this idea of parking under, uh, of retail under the building does make sense in a retail area. A lot of areas, though, aren't, aren't meant for retail, and it won't succeed, which is why that thin layer of residential, which has become very common now around the US, that thin layer of residential or something else blocking the parking. All you need is 20 feet uh, to make it work. So you know, our best streets are full of doors and windows. This is an interesting street. What street is this way? Penn. 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 Uh, you know, you go from feast to famine in one block, right? From there <laughs> to there. Uh, and this used to be shops. This used to be shops and it was filled in, unfortunately, by the county, not as shops. And look, look at the riffraff that you get hanging out around there, right across the street. Sorry, anyone knows that one. She's actually, she's very elegantly dressed, but she is smoking. But you get graffiti, you get people smoking, all because of the, I'll be, I'm joking, but I couldn't help myself. So, um, and then finally, uh, the idea of the blank wall. And the, you know, the winner in this category is, is Philadelphia. And I, I, you know, I lecture nationally, but I show everyone Philadelphia. They have the most amazing mural program. And they've realized, you know, I, used to work, I worked at the National Endowment for the Arts for four years, and I gave out a lot of money supporting public art. And, um, well, I helped. And uh, it wasn't my money. And um, you know, the history of public art in the US for many years through the 20th century was this kind of plop art idea that you plop an inscrutable sculpture down in the middle of a plaza and somehow that makes the place come to life. But of course, what we've learned in, inter in the intervening years and as embodied by Philadelphia is that uh, you can have a you know, fantastic mural program um, that acknowledges that actually the place for public art is where it can serve a remedial function. It can remedy a boring blank wall circumstance. One of the reasons why murals are so great is because without them, walls are super boring. And so that's the place, that's, I would argue, that interesting and accessible art on the walls that are boring is the place to focus your, your art budget. So, you know, here's another you're very accessible, very accessible, right? American example. Here's the European version. Um, but, you know, but take care of it, keep it neat. All right. Anyway, sorry. Um, and that's everything. But you have to do all of it. If you only do some of it, a place isn't really walkable. And that's why it's really important to focus where, where it's possible to do all of it. And that's typically starting in the heart of your downtown, which already looks pretty darn good. And finding the places, for example, um, uh, well, I'm not going to get into, I'm not going to draw this out with more examples. But you have a lot of places that are useful and comfortable and interesting, but the street just isn't safe. Right? And then you have a few places where the street's OK, but there's a missing tooth. So it's not comfortable and interesting, but it is useful and safe. But this, when you can get all four of those things happening at once, that's when you can create really a perfect walkable environment. And you want to start small and start perfect, as perfect as you can make it, and then spread your way out from there. Um, so that's everything. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to contradict myself. I told you I would. Um, in terms of how you spend your money, and I have a, in my, in my new book, which is called Walkable City Rules, I have a, a rule that says rebuild or restripe, question mark. 
And it's a question mark because there's some incredible examples like this one, which is the Main Street of Lancaster, California. I didn't work on it. Uh, it's not Lancaster, it's Lancaster because it's California. And they went from this to this. And you can see the number of lanes is reduced because the car counts allowed it. Um, and of course, it's a plaza, but it's parkable in 2011. And when they did this, the investment was $11.2 million. That's not cheap. But what happened after that investment? Well, car crashes went down 50%. Pedestrian crashes went down 78%. Pedestrian activity doubled. 57 new businesses opened, 800 new housing units were built, 2,000 new jobs arrived uh, with an estimated economic impact of $282 million. <clears throat> now, these are probably pretty aggressive numbers, but you get the point. That sometimes it really does make sense to make a character changing investment in the nature of your downtown. So I don't want to um, limit our ambition to just restriping, uh, but I will say that you have a lot of streets here that could benefit tremendously from a simple restriping. But let's, let's not forget to dream about opportunities like this as well. So that's all I'm gonna show you. I wanna end though with um, the resources that I'm offering you. Um, the first, here's what I wanna say, depending on who you are and what you do, I know that you're all, you all wanna buy one of my books, right? They're, they're actually, they're only, they're only like 40 there, so you're not going to, but I, I the reason I write these books is so that I don't have to give all these talks <laughs> and I don't have to work everywhere and I'm trying to make myself obsolete with these books. And if you are someone who does this work, either as a planner or an engineer or a government official or a, a, you know, an activist or just a really ardent hobbyist, uh, then the new book, Walkable City Rules, is the book for you. But if you're not, then actually I would direct you back to the old book. Because the old book is really, it's designed to be readable and fun and, and interesting and not so many details. The new book has all the details, tons of pictures, tons of diagrams and data and stuff to do the work. So that's how I would direct you to one of these books or the other. I would also direct you to another TED talk I didn't tell you about, which is the 15 minute version of this talk. So if you have a friend who you're talking to tomorrow <coughs> at the water cooler, Say, oh, I heard this great talk last night. Say, well, what, what was it? Say, well, direct them to this 15-minute version of what I just told you. Uh, and then there's the other one I already told you about, both under my name, uh, which is spelled with a K, S-P-E-C-K. Then I teach a class at Harvard every summer, and it's two full days of this kind of stuff, including a case study and other work. You don't have to be a, a designer to come. A lot of people aren't. Um, it's at Harvard, so it's not cheap. But when you're done, you get a piece of paper that honestly makes it look like you graduated from Harvard. <laughs> and that's, that's two days for that. So I really recommend it. Uh, and that's this coming June 21, 22. Um, please let me know if you want to hear about that. Uh, and then finally, my website is, has links to all this stuff I told you about which is jeffspeck.com. And that is everything. I will be at the book table. Please, uh, I'll take, I, I've kept you here long enough, but I, I look forward to talking to you and, and hearing your questions over there. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>